Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on World Wildlife Conservation Day and welcome to our first ever uh, reef debrief for the Southeast Floral, Southeast Florida's Coral Reef uh, Restoration Hub. So this is our kickoff event. Uh, we are so excited to finally being, to be able to have this lecture series for you uh, begin. And this is kind of a teaser for what's to come over the next um, two years. So thank you for joining us today. We're so excited to be able to share our hard work with you all. Um, today, specifically, we're going to be meeting a representative from each of our five partnering organizations. Um, and you'll be able to hear a little bit about what they're going to be doing over the next two years. So um, we're really excited because we think this is the first ever time that these five amazing scientists are going to be in one place talking to you all about all of their really cool science um, research and conservation work. So just some housekeeping. Um, you are gonna be hearing from each of the panelists for about five minutes each. And um, we are going to then have a Q and A session at the end of our chat. So um, if you have any questions while you're hearing the panelists talk, please leave them in the comment section below, either on Facebook or on YouTube. Um, and we will be sure to answer them at the end. This is being recorded, so hopefully you can share it and um, watch it if you need to uh, check in over the next few days. All right, so are we ready to get started um, with our panelists? We are going to start with Andrew Baker. Um, he is a professor at the University of Miami in the Marine Biology and Ecology Department, whose research focuses on coral reefs and climate change. So he, we're excited to have you here today. All right, Andrew. Great, thanks, Shannon. Um, so yeah, on behalf of all of the partners, welcome to our webinar. It's kind of an, an update uh, of all of the activities that we've been doing over the last few months in which we're uh, hoping to continue over the next uh, two years or so. Uh, so the Southeast Florida Coral Reef Restoration Hub is really a consortium of uh, five different organizations, all based in South Florida. And the goal of this hub is to really uh, try to bring together uh, and synthesize all of the activities in this restoration field that we've been doing uh, for the past several years and really sort of synergize so that uh, the, the whole becomes more than the sum of our uh, respective parts. And so I'm going to give a very brief overview of the, of the sort of the 10,000 foot uh, big picture and then pass this along to my colleagues who will talk about the different components. So the overall hub really has four different components. One of the main goals is obviously coral restoration. Um, the, you know, the idea to use both uh, sexual and asexually derived corals to help restore uh, coral reefs in the Miami-Dade and Broward County areas, which is our sort of geographic area of focus. Um, but a second component uh, is, uh, Shannon, if you could move the slides along, the second component is to make sure that the corals that we're um, outplanting uh, actually are more climate resilient, are better able to deal with the warming temperatures of the future um, so that we uh, can anticipate that our efforts uh, aren't lost the next time we get an unusually warm summer or have some other sort of climate related disturbance that uh, undoes our efforts. So we're using a variety of really cutting edge new uh, intervention technologies uh, to try to explore ways to make corals more thermally tolerant. Uh, and then another uh, goal of this uh, overall endeavor is to realize that these reefs help protect the heavily built uh, coastlines of Miami-Dade and Broward counties uh, and all of the infrastructure and all of the people that are involved in that healthy reefs actually help protect our coastlines by reducing uh, wave energy, which ultimately reduces the penetration and inundation of water into our coastlines during the effect of, during, the, during, during large storms. So by reducing storm surge, we're actually protecting property and that has a real uh, value for our bottom line. And the National Coastal Resilience Fund uh, from NIFWFs, the National Fish and Wildlife uh, foundation is uh, really emphasizes this component of the project. And then finally, uh, the last component of the project is education and outreach to not only educate uh, the local people of South Florida about what we're doing and why it's so important, but also try to report back on our progress and also involve, uh, involve citizen scientists, involve local members of the public in some of our efforts as a way of sort of um, 
expanding our efforts. So I'm going to briefly go through some of these different components in, in more detail and then uh, pass us along to uh, our partners. So talking a little bit about the restoration. Oh, I'm sorry. And who are these partners and team members? Um, so as I mentioned, we have um, five different institutions um, uh, with the University of Miami uh, actually being represented by two different schools or colleges. Um, and these uh, organizations are all based in the South Florida area. And as I said, all have a track record in this area. And so this is a really exciting time for us to be able to bring these efforts together. So moving along to the actual activities. Uh, so for our restoration, the goal is to plant over 150,000 coral colonies, including both adults and uh, recruits or sort of coral babies of multiple species um, onto at least 20 different reefs in the Miami-Dade and Broward area. And as we do that, the idea is that in, uh, those efforts will help towards the recovery of uh, three uh, coral species that are listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. This will also help increase the spatial connectivity and genetic diversity of those populations, all of which are good for overall increasing the resilience of, uh, of the reefs in our area. And by doing this, we're also going to be essentially creating repositories of genetic diversity across multiple different nurseries so that we have redundancy. And if, if uh, a hurricane or something were to come through one nursery and damage some of those, some of those stock, we would have sort of replicate stock in other nurseries that we could use as backups. Um, so that's a really important sort of component of uh, collaborating and, and building this for the future. We're also going to be uh, mitigating disease impacts on many of these colonies, uh, evaluating the role of sea urchins as really critical herbivores in helping sort of maintain the reef habitat and making sure that it remains uh, sort of healthy for coral, corals, especially, especially coral babies. Um, and obviously the goal here is to try to restore reefs as ecosystems, uh, which are really important for providing essential fish and invertebrate habitat, uh, which is uh, critically important for South Florida's uh, tourism and recreational uh, uh, fisheries um, and commercial fisheries economies. Uh, and as I mentioned before, you know, reefs are important in protect terms of protecting our coastlines. And so they have immense value for that uh, from that perspective. But as part of these restoration goals, we're also going to be building our climate resilience, as I mentioned. Uh, next slide, Shannon. And so the idea here is that uh, as we uh, restore these reefs, we'll actually also be using a variety of um, state of the science methods uh, that are really where the, the sort of represent the cutting edge of where intervention science and coral reef restoration uh, are coming together. So we'll be using corals from uh, that we've identified from slightly warmer areas uh, within the region and using those as stock to plant out to areas that are slightly cooler but which are expected to warm and this is a great way of sort of preparing those outplants for uh, future climate change and future warming by essentially introducing genotypes that we think are more thermally adapted to uh, the coming uh, the coming years the future that is obviously going to be warmer we're also looking at using inshore corals as sources of resilient corals that if planted onto offshore reefs uh, may actually help them increase their climate resilience but also their disease resistance um, so that we can sort of help confront the challenge facing Florida's reefs of stony coral tissue loss disease. And we have a variety of other methods that we're using to sort of boost the thermal tolerance of corals through stress hardening and algal manipulations uh, and some other very exciting uh, methods that we're testing. Uh, as I mentioned before, a critical uh, goal of the National Coastal Resilience Fund is to use these built reefs as um, essentially uh, bulwarks, um, underwater structures that will help protect our coastlines from damaging effects of storm and storms. And you will hear more about this uh, coming up. We're using uh, the University of Miami State of the Science Sustain Facility, which is an enormous wind wave tank capable of generating a hurricane category five force winds and waves to essentially uh, model and test the ability of corals to reduce wave energy um, so that we can improve our predictions of, of uh, how useful reefs might be and, and where might be critical areas for uh, implementation in terms of where do you get the most bang for the buck, so to speak. And then finally, uh, education and uh, outreach. The idea here uh, is that we'll not only be involving citizen scientists in our efforts so that they get really hands-on experience in coral restoration and help spread the word that way, but also we'll be using our social media and web platforms to help um, disseminate information and um, 
and talk about some of our great results. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, pass on to the, uh, the next uh, person in the team, um, and uh, we will take questions at the end. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so next up, we have Brian Walker, who is a research scientist at the Helmholtz College of Arts and Sciences at Nova Southeastern University. Brian is going to discuss how Nova is helping expand this research and coral restoration efforts in uh, up north into Broward County. So take it away. Thanks, Shannon, and thanks, Andrew. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be involved in this uh, amazing project. Um, Andrew did a great job outlining what we are uh, trying to do as a whole, which is no small task whatsoever. And uh, NSU is, is proud to be a part of this effort. Um, I'm a research scientist at, at Nova Southeastern University, along with my colleague, uh, Dr. Dave Gilliam. Uh, our role is to collaborate on the, the restoration research and expand the ongoing restoration activities both in scale and in space uh, throughout the region, but mostly in the more northern parts of the region in northern Miami-Dade and Broward County. Uh, I run a GIS spatial ecology lab at, at NOVA and uh, Dr. Gilliam runs the Coral Reef Restoration Assessment and Monitoring Lab, or the CRAM lab as it's known. And uh, our efforts are by no means uh, singular. We, we certainly rely on a large uh, effort from our staff and students to help us along. So uh, just know that this work is being done by many, many people that we are representing here today. Next slide, please. So first I wanted to give you kind of an understanding of, of where we are in terms of what's been done in the past. Uh, when, when, we, when we're looking at uh, doing this project, we wanted to, to determine you know, where restoration has occurred and how successful it was throughout the region. And uh, if you look at the map on the, the left side, you'll see a lot of black dots. Those were the locations where something had been done in the past uh, by, by the groups involved here. And, uh, and then we, we set out to categorize uh, our sites for this project into three categories, uh, expansion sites, uh, new sites, and then showcase sites. And the expansion sites, uh, well, those are shown on the second map, uh, just to the left, or just, yeah, just to the left. The expansion sites uh, are already established sites that have high coral survivorship and growth from restored corals over the past three years. So they're very successful uh, at least they've been successful in the short term, and uh, so they make sense to continue the efforts at those sites and expand them. The new sites, um, or strate strategically <laughs> chosen sites, uh, based on spatial gaps in, in throughout the entire region, as you can see in the middle, there hasn't been a lot done previously, so we wanted to add some activity in kind of middle northern Miami-Dade County that are also a good source habitat uh, for larval connectivity uh, through modeling. And so the hope is that our restoration activities at these um, source sites will provide a much better um, reproductive success and allow the reefs to recover on their own uh, more quickly. And then we have a, a number of showcase sites. There's four, two in Miami-Dade, two in Broward County. Um, the little yellow stars, combine all of the proposed restoration adaptation activities and coral species uh, into high visibility locations um, for synergistic benefit. And, and basically that is saying all of the, 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 the things that Andrew had presented, uh, we're gonna try and put those out at the showcase sites where the public can also you know, visit and, and see that activity that's happening. Next slide. So Dr. Gilliam's part of this uh, with the CRAM lab is um, building off of the nurseries and, and, and um, restoration activities that he's done over geez, maybe the past decade or so. Uh, they have a number of tree nurseries and, and they've done a lot of out planting uh, with local groups like uh, Lauderdale by the Sea and Broward County. Um, now uh, partnering with this larger consortium, we're able to begin to share the genetic diversity between uh, 
our, our, our uh, coral nurseries. Uh, Dr. Gilliam's planning on outplanting 5,000 uh, staghorn coral colonies, another uh, 1,500 massive colonies. And those will hopefully be uh, a, a combination of propagated um, colonies and also sexually produced colonies from our partners at Frost and, and Florida Aquarium and Seacor. So I think the partnership uh, is going to really um, help these nurse uh, these uh, restoration sites um, be very successful. Next slide. Unfortunately, uh, throughout the past five or six years, uh, there's been a coral disease event on our reefs that has hammered the uh, coral populations extensively. It started in um, central Miami-Dade County in 2014 and spread quickly to the north and south throughout the uh, almost the entire Florida reef tract in a number of about five years. Um, this disease has changed the landscape in terms of uh, the coral communities and has affected uh, upwards of 20, 20 species of corals. So uh, a lot has been done over the course of the last few years to understand um, the disease and respond to the disease event, including um, treatment testing. Luckily, we found a treatment that is uh, over 80%, sometimes 90% effective. Um, it's in, uh, using antibiotic paste uh, on the disease uh, on individual corals. And so a lot of our research has been to um, do disease intervention uh, in, in the water, just visit corals and treat them. So our proposed efforts here, um, next slide, please. Our proposed efforts here are going to be to expand those disease intervention activities to allow us to uh, hopefully uh, reduce the amount of disease that are on the reefs, which can also reduce the spread of the disease um, as, as the tissue sloughs off, it can be carried down and reinfect new corals. So um, our goal is to uh, integrate the disease interventions into these restoration activities and then we, we, we've recognized a number of large colonies that have died because of the disease. And so we wanna use our partners uh, expertise and, and um, donor colonies to uh, allow us to try to resheet these large dead colonies uh, so that we can maintain that structure even though the, the tissue has died now, perhaps we can get the tissue to grow back across these structures and continue to build through time. Um, so that's about all I have for you today. Uh, we're excited to continue our work and next off is Margaret. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, so as you can see, next up we have Margaret Miller and she is the research director at Seacore International and she will be discussing the development of breeding and larval propagation methods to upscale coral restoration. Thank you so much, Shannon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, you can start with the next slide. So as Shannon mentioned, I'm with Seacore International. We are a nonprofit organization and we focus on developing methods for coral breeding and restoration. And I'll be talking about a couple of reasons that we think that coral breeding is important. Uh, next slide. Um, most coral restoration and production for restoration um, is based on fragmentation where corals have the capacity when a branch breaks off that it can form into a new brand new colony. And this is the, uh, process that most of the coral propagation um, in the Caribbean region is based on. It's been very successful and it's a great way to create a lot more coral. But that we're creating more coral in one sense and that is we're creating more colonies, we're creating more biomass. But because essentially all of these colonies, new colonies, are clones of the colony that we started with, um, in another sense we're not creating any new in genetic individuals. Um, next slide. New genetic individuals are created um, in a process commonly known as sex, which is a bit more complicated than just uh, breaking off a branch. In this case, um, genetic um, mater uh, material is combined from two different parents to form babies with unique genetic combinations. Next slide, please. Indeed, there are a lot of complicated steps involved in the life of a baby coral. 
They have, they spend a period of time in the plankton. They're very tiny. They have to find a place to settle on the reef where they have to stay for the rest of their lives. So there's a lot of hurdles here, but Secor is working on methods and approaches to assist in all of these early life stages. Next slide, please. So this involves all of the steps from collecting the eggs and sperm when they're spawned from an adult coral, um, in vitro fertilization and raising the larvae through this uh, planktonic stage um, and using designed substrates to settle the corals on that can then be transferred to the reef. Next slide, please. So all of these complicated steps in coral breeding, we think is worthwhile to contribute to coral restoration, partly because it increases a genetic diversity, as I just explained, but it also provides the capacity for large scaling. Corals spawn profusely, and there's definitely potential for producing millions of baby corals, perhaps from each um, individual coral spawning event. So it gives potential for very large scale production. Next, please. Here you see um, two of the different uh, tools that CCOR has been um, developing to work towards this large scale production of coral babies. Um, these large pools or mesocosms um, are designed to um, be uh, placed in near shore areas to contain the coral larvae during the time that they're developing in the plankton. And then we provide these designed substrates you see in the corner, different models that we've been testing um, to provide the corals um, a settlement habitat. Now we've used these uh, pools in many locations they're especially helpful for places where there aren't uh, many places that need coral restoration, where there aren't land-based facilities or labs or aquaculture um, facilities. So they're designed to run in near shore areas. However, as we contemplated bringing these approaches to South Florida, of course, the density of people and boats and storms and the very warm temperatures that the near shore waters often have in the summer when the coral babies are trying to grow, um, we had concerns about that being inappropriate to, to deploy in the waters just offshore from Miami. Next slide. So we were extremely thankful um, to be hosted by Frost Science um, at their Bachelor Environmental Center. They maintain these very large quarantine tanks that are um, sheltered and they have temperature control. And so these uh, larval mesocosms uh, proved to work quite well at this facility and we were able to um, be successful in raising and settling a lot of corals. So frost science had a very strong contribution in this effort. Next, please. Along with several other um, of the project partners, we were successful in observing and collecting coral spawning. Um, this is not at all assured given the poor health of parent coral populations in this region, um, but we were very thankful we were able to document spawning both at one of the coral nurseries, UM's coral nursery you see up in the upper picture um, where uh, spawning took place and also at one of the restoration sites, previous restoration sites, we were able to collect uh, staghorn coral spawning as well as several other species of coral um, right here from the Miami area as well as Biscayne National Park and a little bit further south in Key Largo. Next please. These coral babies did settle successfully on these little design substrates here you can see a couple of them. Um, as after they've been trans, transplanted out into a, several various reef sites throughout the Miami area. Um, we were able to uh, outplant quite a number of substrates with baby corals on them. Of course, the baby corals are extremely small at this stage. Um, but you can see this one on the left is a small po individual polyp of elkhorn coral. Again, elkhorn coral is one of the most endangered species in our region, and so this was particularly exciting. Um, you can see it here. It's ghostly white, it's hard to see, it's transparent because it hasn't obtained its algal symbionts yet. But by placing them on the reef, they'll be able to adopt symbionts that are suited to the particular reef habitat where they'll be um, growing in the future. So this was an exciting first year for our efforts. It was great working with the other partners and I'll turn it back to Shannon, thank you. Awesome, thanks, Margaret. All right, next up we have Amber Whittle um, and she is the Director of Grants and Foundations at the Florida Aquarium, our farthest away partner. Um, and she is here to discuss what they will be doing um, where she is to help with the hub. Great, thanks Shannon. And 
I'm very excited to be a partner in this um, venerable group that are, that's doing a really important restoration effort. So as Margaret talked about in situ coral sexual reproduction, um, the Florida Aquarium is focused on ex situ. As, as Shannon mentioned, we are far away, um, close to Tampa, but we have on land greenhouses and infrastructure to be able to spawn corals um, and diadema, which are long spine sea urchins. Next, please. So as Brian mentioned, there is a large disease um, still affecting the corals um, throughout the Florida reef tract. And NOAA and FWC led an effort to try and save the corals ahead of the disease boundary. And they've taken about 2,000 of these corals out and the Florida Aquarium houses about 117 of them. Next slide, please. So these are our corals. Um, they, this is when they first came in. Now they're much bigger and we need more tanks for them. But they're of about 15 different species and we have spawned the majority of them. I think right now we're at probably about 10 of them. And a lot of these species have never been held in captivity and they've certainly never been spawned. All right, next slide, please. So this is where we do a majority of our spawning of the more difficult species. Some of our species spawn very well in the greenhouse. And then we have these called our induced spawning chambers. And they mimic the, the natural cues based on a buoy out of Key West. Um, but we actually switch their day night so that they spawn during the day when our scientists are there. Um, what Margaret did mention was the um, endless uh, environmental factors that you come across when you're trying to get spawn in the wild. It's always a bad weather day or there's a jellyfish invasion. You just have to skip days. Some days, um, there were two years of Elkhorn corals where no, nothing spawned. So this helps control that. And then also we get to concentrate the sperm and the eggs, um, especially the sperm. And then we can cryopreserve too. So if something goes off one day and then the next day a different sex goes off or a different individual, we can combine to increase the genetic diversity, which increases the potential for adaptation. Next slide, please. So this is a video that gives you a visual of what we look like. So this is our conservation campus in Apollo Beach. That's our sea turtle building. And here is our coral greenhouses. This is where a lot of our rescue species are held, including our pillar coral species, which there are about 40 or fewer left in the wild. And so we have almost 200 in our greenhouses. So this is what spawning looks like. This is a female pillar coral spawning. So what we'll do is collect those eggs and we will combine them with sperm. We usually put the, the males when they start going into buckets to concentrate it. This is sorting and getting ready for cryopreservation. And here's Carrie showing um, the larvae. So we put them in these salad containers and depending on the species, they stay in there two to five or seven days um, until the larvae can swim. And then we settle them on these plates, similar to what Margaret has with her stars. Um, and we have to keep splitting them up. That's why there are lots of little tiles. And then this was um, in 2018, we did a, a large staghorn, sexual reproduced staghorn outplanting. And so this is just the end result. So these are our pillar corals spawning. And within the sea turtle building, that's where our induced spawning chambers and our cryopreservation lab is, um, and our diadema lab. So this is um, our sea core partnership. So we sent tens of thousands of larvae to CCOR, to NSU, and to UM. Um, and then CCOR also sent back about 250 stars um, that we're raising to see the difference between how they're raised within the greenhouses and how they're raised um, within their, um, their chambers at Frost. Next, please. And then these are some of the babies that we have um, settled and are sending to University of Miami to outplant directly. Next, please. And then the other exciting thing we're doing is in partnership with the University of Florida is um, we are looking at um, diadema reproduction. And Andy will talk more about the history of this and why it's important in a second. Um, but we have about 13 adult broodstock. We put them in that large blue bucket and raise the temperature about two degrees Celsius and they pretty reliably spawn. We get lots and lots and lots of gametes um, and then we we put them into our, the larvae into our larviculture lab. So we have these chrysals that are con in constant motion to keep 
um, the larvae off of the bottom. They're very, very delicate. All right, next. And so here's some pictures of what they look like um, from two hours old to the juveniles at 100 days. We can settle out the juveniles in about 35 to 40 days, but that's really the crucial point that University of Florida is really researching is the metamorphosis from larvae to um, settler. And so we send these, oh, sorry, we send these juveniles either to um, Frost or to University of Miami or to FWC. So we have several partners that are really looking at how to best outplant them. Thank you, Shannon. Awesome, thank you so much, Amber. Um, all right, so next up we have Landolf uh, Rode Barabergos, uh, and he is an assistant professor in the Civil Architecture and Environmental Engineering Department at the University of Miami. And Landolf is going to discuss shoreline protection measures um, that they are taking. Thank you, Shannon. Hello, everyone. Let me start by saying that I'm very excited to be part of this project and learning about corals, how they grow, but also how important they are for our environments both the natural and the built environment. Now, as an engineer in this project, my role is to assess the impact of coral reefs on waves so that we can merge restoration and engineering knowledge to design shoreline protection structures. Now, coral reefs provide a wide variety of ecosystem services, including shoreline protection. However, the protective features vary according to environmental and physical parameters. On the other hand, our human-made structures provide the required protection, but they're not always as eco-friendly as they should. By combining coral reefs with properly designed structures, we can actually lead to new, efficient, and eco-friendly solutions for shoreline protection. Next slide, please. So coral reefs act as low-crested submerged breakwaters. They reduce wave height and dissipate wave energy. We can use them to stabilize the shoreline by reducing erosion. We can also protect our build environment from flooding and wave impact. You should note that Florida's coral reefs have been estimated to provide 675 million in flood protection benefits every year. How do they do that? Well, corals dissipate wave energy through breaking and bottom friction. Breaking is when the wave loses its stability and collapses, while friction is the resistance from the bottom of the sea to the motion of the wave. Our goal is to quantify the impact of the coral reef morphology on these two parameters. Next slide, please. So to do that, we do testing, physical testing of corals and artificial coral reef models in the University of Miami Search Structure Atmosphere Interaction Facility, the SUSTAIN facility as Andrew introduced earlier. So SUSTAIN is a wind wave tank, which offers us the ability of doing tests under controlled wind, water, and wave conditions at a relatively large scale. As illustrated here, what we do in our test is we use coral skeletons and we measure the wave heights before and after the coral reef models to estimate the dissipation that occurs. Next slide, please. So what you see here on the left is a video of sustaining action under hurricane conditions, which means that we have both mechanically generated as well as wind-driven waves. On the right side, you have two configurations of our artificial stack on coral reef model. The first configuration is just a breakwater, a typical gray structure, while the second one is a breakwater with stack on coral skeletons on it. Next to them, you have the wave dissipation that occurred during three tests. So the contribution of the coral skeleton is highlighted in green. So what we can see there is basically that the presence of the coral skeletons amplifies the dissipative characteristics of that structure. This result, this quantification of the amplification is critical in merging restoration and engineering knowledge for shoreline protection. So we look forward to testing more coral morphologies, different types of corals, densities, heights, and also different types of structures. So we can actually learn more as, as we conserve and restore, we can also explore the coral reef for coastal protection. That's all from my side, thank you. 
Thank you so much, Landoff. Um, all right, so last but not least, we have our very own Andy Dehart, who is the Vice President of Animal Husbandry and Marine Conservation here at Frost Science. And Andy will be showcasing the holistic approaches that Frost Science is taking um, to coral reef conservation. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, appreciate your help in emceeing this event. That's no small task in itself, but I am Andy from Frost Science. We are a relatively new facility open in, opened in 2017 in downtown Miami. Um, we reach roughly between 500 and 700,000 visitors per year um, in what is a state-of-the-art science museum, planetarium, but also a major public aquarium. Um, what our, our focus at the museum outside of our science outreach is really looking at the aquatic habitats of South Florida and their ecosystems. One of the primary ones being the coral reef environment. So our role within the restoration hub is looking at the urchin settlement techniques, um, also kind of a new innovative reef restoration strategies and very much like the Florida Aquarium focusing on public engagement and education. Next slide, Shannon. So one of the, the fun aspects that we get to work with in this project is uh, these really sharp spiny things, the long spine sea urchins. Um, they're diadema urchins, they're also called. Unfortunately, in 1983 and 1984, there was a major die off throughout the Caribbean and here in Florida where um, roughly 80 to 90% of the diadema died off. Um, so these animals play a really important role on the coral reef in that they feed on turf algaes and all other types of algaes on the reef. You may think that might not be a big deal, but these baby corals that we're working really hard to grow, that we're working really hard to breed, need a really clean surface to settle down on. They'll float through the currents, they'll look for this ideal place to set up shop for the rest of their life, which could be three, 400 years. That cue needs to be a nice clean surface and substrate to sit on. These urchins do that by scouring the reef to feed on the algae that they need. As we saw earlier, the Florida Aquarium in partnership with the University of Florida has done an amazing job getting diadema to spawn, um, get to settle, getting them to get out of the larval stage and into a kind of settled juvenile urchins has been the hardest trick that's been worked on for upwards of 30, 40 years. Um, but Florida Aquarium's done a great job cracking that nut. And our role in that is working with them in terms of what, how do we grow these things faster? How do we get them to settle better? When we do augment the reef restoration work with diadema urchins, what's the best size to put them out? Is it dime, nickel, quarter, bigger than that? And then also looking at on these restoration sites as we're putting down the jacks from seed core with the baby corals on them, is there a benefit to putting down these jacks or these, these substrates with baby urchins and baby corals together? That's what we hope to look at. Next slide, Shana. Another thing in looking at reef restoration and one of the things that I'm really excited about this project is we're, we're taking a more holistic approach. This isn't just, we're gonna grow staghorn coral, we're gonna plant as many as we can. We are looking at the whole reef uh, structure, the whole reef ecology. Um, one of those is sponges. We know it's possible to farm and aquaculture sponges. We're gonna be taking a role looking at large barrel sponges can we grow them in a kind of in a aquaculture situation, much like we're doing the corals, and then add those into the reef component? One thing that we're very curious about is can sponges take out the pathogen that's causing this story, stony, tish, stony coral tissue disease? And if, if the sponges can take out that pathogen, can we augment these reefs by adding more sponges, either in the natural environment or perhaps having aquaculture trees of sponges in the area to assist with coral health. The other thing we're looking at is removal of a, of a native coral species called Palithoa. Um, this is not a bad coral, it's not exotic, but unfortunately in kind of marginalized habitats, this coral is really resistant and grows very fast. So it has a, a tendency to outcompete and potentially smother these baby corals that are being planted down. So we're looking at um, in different spots along these 20 different areas of the reef, removing some of this palithoa, does that help restoration efforts? Is it indifferent or does it, does it not make a difference at all? So that's one of the other aspects that we are looking at. Next slide, Shannon. And then along with, I think every facility and every organization in this partnership, we are looking at engagement and education. 
I think us as well as Florida Aquarium uh, have the blessing of having numerous hundreds of thousands of people literally coming through our door as active engage engagement. Um, they are coming to us for science knowledge. Obviously the universities have students that are coming to learn marine science, but and they have incredibly powerful social media and uh, PR arms. But this is really a place for science to come alive, both here in at Florida Aquarium. And um, we have a coral lab within the Frost Science Museum um, where we see a much smaller subset of our guests. You know, we see between five and 700,000. But in our coral lab, it, it, it is open to the public. And on any given year, we'll have 24,000 face-to-face intimate conversations about coral restoration. This isn't just reading a graphic. This is our guests talking to the scientists that are engaged in this project. Um, we partnered with Andrew Baker and UM doing thermal stressing of corals in the same laboratory about a year ago. And it is a great place to kind of demonstrate what's happening uh, in, in this project, both on the West Coast and here within the universities, CCOR and the public aquarium. So it is this model of using exhibit decor, exhibit um, ideas to be able to convey what we're doing. That top image is actually a, a live exhibit that we have of a coral tree that replicates what's being done by NSU uh, and UM. So we're excited to be able to show off uh, the work that's being done by this great group. Next slide. And then just from my part from Frost, we're, we're super thankful to host this first kickoff event. You can look towards our partners I think we're all gonna take turns uh, hosting these debriefs so that you can follow what's happened. This is just our kickoff meeting to explain to you guys what we hope to do over the course of this three-year project. Um, but for me personally, I think what's really exciting about this is you have a very diverse group here. There's two major universities, a non, an environmental nonprofit and two public aquariums. And in, in normal kind of history on normal problems, we would oftentimes be competing for the same amount of money to get these different projects done. And what I really like about this project is we've all come together, we've pooled our resources, we've pooled our expertise. And by doing that, we're able to, to take a stretch of reef all the way from Broward County to the very Southern tip of, of Miami-Dade County, and actually hopefully do meaningful restoration that's more than just out planting corals, but looking at a holistic ecosystem entirely. Awesome, thank you so much, Andy. All right, so I'm going to now invite our panelists to come back on and all join us. Um, and I'm gonna field you some questions. So for everyone watching, please, again, feel free to write your questions um, in the chat on either Facebook or on YouTube. Uh, but first up, Brian, um, you have a question. So this is from Colleen Campbell, and she wants to know, how are you doing the modeling? Are you doing site suitability analysis? And what do you mean by spatial gaps? She's really interested in GIS going into this project and um, she wants to you know, are you using GIS to determine um, what's best location for the donor colonies? It's a good one yes. for the first one, huh? You're ready. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Uh, certainly, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear people are inspired by GIS. I think it's an incredibly powerful tool uh, that can be used for many, many aspects, including coral reef science. Um, yeah, th the modeling that I refer to is larval connectivity modeling, and, and that's done um, by a highly technical group out of Belgium who has come up with a, a particularly uh, accurate model that looks at the, the uh, flow of water um, in relation to space and then models that through time um, based on uh, certain larval parameters, certain coral larva parameters to see uh, wh when, if, if coral spawn at a certain time, where they'll end up uh, down the road. And so their model takes in uh, real data and then uh, models that data. Um, and so uh, what their outputs are, are, are these areas that show high connectivity. Like in, in this case, uh, a lot of areas where, where corals spawned um, all connected to these certain locations or many of them connected to certain locations. And so we wanna identify those locations um, because that's an indication that if corals are spread out and they're spawning in different locations, 
but they may they may wind up um, they may wind up sort of uh, coming together in, in in these source areas, and 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 then of course the the um, the hope is that they settle and they're successful and then they reproduce and they're they're nearer to each other and so they can continue. Um, does that help answer your question? Hopefully. Okay. <laughs> we'll be watching on Facebook. So if there's more questions that come in or specific to that one, we can reach back out. All right. So next up we have um, from Michael Barnes. I think Andrew, you can answer this best. Uh, will volunteer citizen divers be able to help with this program? Yes, very much so. So my colleague, uh, Diego Learman, who actually is the sort of the lead investigator over the whole consortium, uh, he runs a program called Rescue a Reef, which is run out of the University of Miami. Um, you can find it online, just search on Rescue a Reef, University of Miami. And they take divers out to uh, train them and engage them with reef restoration activities. So I totally encourage you, if you're interested, to uh, follow up uh, with that. Awesome. And then if anyone has any other ways, um, someone asks, what are some of the ways that the general public can support the effort if it's not directly going out and doing citizen science? Well, I think uh, I invite everybody else to contribute if you want, but um, uh, I think uh, just recognizing that um, we know we have this tremendous resource off our coastlines and that there's a lot of different activities that we do that ultimately uh, impact that resource. So it's everything from uh, the kinds of uh, water quality that we subject these corals to. Um, so that has to do with whether we're using um, pesticides or even fertilizers on our own lawns, which leads to groundwater and pollution offshore um, through to you know carbon footprints and reducing our carbon footprint because ultimately that's going to help corals uh, survive climate change. And also sort of uh, keeping abreast of the kinds of um, activities that go on off of our coastlines um, because many of those um, things affect coral reefs and, um, you know, it's very much a sort of out of sight, out of mind sort of problem. Um, you know, we've got some major dredging activities going on, for example, off of South Florida. Uh, with the Port of Miami was dredged recently and uh, Port Everglades is going to be dredged very soon. Uh, in fact, Port of Miami may be dredged again very soon. And there's good evidence that, you know, corals really don't do well under some of those dredge plumes. Uh, and so everything we can do to try to make sure that those activities are well regulated and monitored uh, would be great. Awesome. All right, Andy, you're up. Um, Lee Gildedin wants to know, um, do palatholoa toxins cause any issues for divers when they're removing them? Yes, they certainly can. Palatholoa toxin is, is a, a deadly toxin. Um, so that's not something that the, the volunteer team at Rescue Reef will be participating in. <laughs> Um, it, there's been, you know, crazy stories of people actually being poisoned by doing siphoning of their home aquariums. And, uh, so it is something that we do need to handle, uh, carefully, um, and in our mitigation strategies with that. Awesome. And this one is for everyone's so whoever wants to chime in first. Um, how has COVID-19 impacted this project? Anyone really want to take a stab at that? Well, I can start because we're land-based, it hasn't really. So that's been great. <laughs> and that's one of the um, important aspects of having a variety of methodologies um, to get it where we're going, uh, because at certain points we'll have weather issues or um, at other points, you know, we won't be successful. So that is um, a great question. Yeah, I'll just add quickly. I mean, it has affected, I think, everyone's work. Um, no matter what your work is. So um, particularly during the coral spawning season this year, um, as Amber said, it was great that we had these different opportunities from different places, but in a lot of cases, um, most teams still had restrictions about how many people they could have on a boat and how many bodies could be in a lab um, at one time and things like that. So there definitely were extra challenges this year, um, which is partly why I think the fact that we were able to be successful with raising some baby corals was even more exciting than in a normal year, because there definitely were some extra challenges. Yes, all right. I have one uh, from Margaret. How did you come up for the design for the pools and um, the substrates for the core larvae? 
Thanks. Yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. So the pools actually, um, there had been a couple different groups working in the Pacific over the past 10 years or so that had tried this same sort of idea, just of having some sort of floating structure that could be in the ocean to keep the larvae in the ocean. So there's actually a group in Japan that has tried something similar and a group in Australia both that had tried this kind of similar idea. Secor particularly had started with a much rickettier, you know, some PVC and some floats and some water tanks and things like that, sort of a, you know, a homemade version um, that we had tested actually in 2017. And then the, the version that you saw the picture of was um, we engaged with some other designers, some folks that worked um, making and manufacturing like ocean mesocosms for other types of science, but also then a manufacturer who makes um, river rafts. You might notice they are made with a pontoon on the top. So it's actually a river raft manufacturer that we've been working with um, to make those. So um, in terms of the substrates, um, this is an aspect that there's a lot of ecology, there's a lot of research out there in the literature about how baby corals like to settle and what types of microhabitats they like and you know nooks and crannies or this type of um, shape. So there's a quite a bit of scientific literature that we started with. Um, some, uh, some of our own work as well that's just looked at both then the microhabitats were a factor but then the overall shape of the units. Um, Andy had referred to them as jacks, which is true. Some of the earlier versions um, were more of a tetrapod shape. And that was originally based on the idea, again, our, our goal was to get something that was sort of a self-stabilizing shape so that we could get away from too much of the work that happens with nailing and attaching and gluing and that sort of thing. So having a shape that could kind of nestle itself into the reef. And so that tetrapod shape was based on many design structures like like Landolf was referring to for breakwaters and things like that, where they would use those interlocking types of, of tetrapod shapes or jacks, jack type of shape was kind of the inspiration originally for those. And then we've been adapting those um, over the past several years, um, both for the stability of them and for the sort of ecological function as good a home as they can provide for the baby corals. Awesome, thank you so much. All right, so we're running out of time. Um, and so if anyone else watching, you still have questions, please still feel free to enter them in the comments and we will um, get back to you as soon as we can. Uh, but what I am gonna do is I'm gonna ask each one of our panelists one more question um, and it is, what is your hope for the future of coral reefs? So I'm gonna start, go down the line and just see what your hope for the future is. Andy, do you wanna kick it off? Sure. I mean, I think my hope is that the next generation of children can experience coral reefs the way we all did on this panel, because I think the coral reefs have added a great deal of value to my life. And hopefully the next generation will get to experience that as well. Just not just from a aesthetic standpoint, but from a commercial standpoint and an ecology standpoint. All right, Brian. Hi, I think you're going to get similar answers. Uh, I, I feel that way as well. I have to uh, daughters and I've seen a steady decline in the reefs since I was a kid here in South Florida. Um, and I've traveled the world and seen amazing reefs that are still in, in very, very good condition. So I have hope that we can um, turn the tide, uh, turn the trajectory of what's been happening over the past hundred years here and other places and uh, be able to sustain some sort of beautiful reef system off our coasts so that our children can enjoy them like we do. All right, Andrew. Hi there. Um, yeah, sort of variation on a theme. You know, I think we hear a lot about the decline of coral reefs worldwide and especially in Florida. And I like to think of it um, as a, a sort of a glass half full uh, view on of the problem. So I think about these reefs as being like gigantic jigsaw puzzles. And once upon a time, these jigsaw puzzles were intact and, and beautiful. And what's happened over the last few decades is we've kind of dismantled the jigsaw puzzle and we've kind of moved everything around and it's often difficult to see what we're looking at anymore. Um, but the critical thing to remember is, as far as we know, we haven't actually lost any of the pieces of the puzzle yet. Um, and of course, you know, everyone who's ever done a puzzle realizes that's the most frustrating thing because you can never get it back again. The pieces are all there, and so we just need to rearrange them in a way that it will sort of self-assemble again. And I think I take a, a great deal of optimism from, from that viewpoint. And, you know, although we've lost a lot, 
we still have an awful lot to lose. And so every little uh, step that we take to help protect these reefs is, is really important. And this reminds me of one thing that I mentioned, uh, or forgot to mention rather, when, when I got the question about what can you do, what can members of the public do to help? And the obvious thing to do is you could donate. Uh, we're all nonprofit organizations and we're all uh, in it for the long haul and trying to make a difference. And so if you feel like that's the best way for you to help us, we obviously encourage that. And you can obviously find how to do that online at any of our respective uh, websites. Thank you. All right, Amber. Thank you. Um, to add on to all of that, I hope there are so many competing interests and there are so many things um, that environmentally um, are in crisis, you know, whether it's um, climate change disasters or biodiversity and corals are sort of um, the tip of the iceberg on that. And I'd really, what I hope is that someone figures out how to really get people to understand the importance of corals and make that go viral. I understand we all work with how to make that important and I hope we have communicated that to you. Um, but I do not understand how something goes viral. And I would love if someone watching could tell us or do it for us, figure out how to make people really understand that this is a very important issue and um, that we're working towards it. And whether that's with donations or just, you know, talking to your legislatures that this is a really important um, issue so that we do have it for our kids. This presentation is live. Let's make it go viral. <laughs> All right, Margaret, what about you? Oh, goodness. So to add on, it's, it's hard going later, but I guess I, I'll just echo a couple of things. I think what Andrew said, like we have all of the pieces yet, and that's really my hope in being involved with restoration, particularly coral restoration. We just need to keep all those pieces around over the next couple of decades, because honestly, climate change is going to keep getting worse, no matter, even if we could get our act together and start fixing it effectively, it's going to be a long time before our environment stabilizes. And so my hope, I'm more of a pessimist, maybe my hopes are that we can just keep all those pieces around, all those corals with us and in some semblance of working populations long enough that the environment can be hospitable for them again. But that means we also have to change the way that we treat the environment. Awesome. All right, Landoff, last but not least. Well, my hope resonates everybody's message there. Um, uh, as a citizen, as a father, and as an engineer here, I have to say that it's very important that we do these kind of projects, that we bring the scientists and they inform us how to design for the future, how we can promote restoration, give it new dimensions there. So these collaborations are key for the future. This will expand to policy changes and other, let's say, uh, changes that are also very important and will support whatever we do on the science perspective. So thank you all. Awesome, I completely agree. Um, I'm gonna add my hope as well is that we see more and more of these types of partnerships uh, because I think a lot of times we can all get caught in our own work, in our own bubble and the fact that we're all working together. I think it's a really big inspiration for other universities, other nonprofits, other uh, museums and aquariums. So I'm excited that we are going to keep these up for the next uh, two years. So this is like we said earlier, it is just our kickoff meeting. Um, so keep an eye out on our social media platforms at Restoration Hub so that you can see when the next meeting is. You can see all the updates. Um, but thank you so much for our panelists. Thanks for everyone watching for your support today. If anyone has anything else that you wanted to add. Great. Well, have a great rest of your day and enjoy your weekend, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us.